All right, we're ready to get started on our uh, exploration of Schopenhauer's view on architecture in light of all the stuff we've already said about his, his overall view of aesthetics. I think we kind of laid the groundwork for this in, 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 in previous videos, so I won't go into any all that background stuff. You can look at the previous stuff to talk about, you know, to where I talk about the, what he means by the will and, and all this. Uh, it's going to come out, though, in these observations about architecture, though, right off the bat. We'll look at this quote here uh, where he talks about where do we find the will when we look at a work of architecture, when we look at architectural structure, right? Like this is the uh, inside rotunda of the, uh, the Reichstag in Berlin, right? This is sort of their, their uh, uh, legislative building. And uh, where do we see the will here, right? This is just a bunch of dead material. It's a rather aesthetically pleasing uh, a piece of architecture, right? But where do we see will manifested in this? Um, well, for, for Schopenhauer, it's in the two forces of gravity and rigidity, okay? So these are, for him, the lower gradations of will, right? When we look at the world around us, uh, the world is filled with all these different phenomena, and each of them, for him, are an expression of this underlying will, and there are higher and lower gradations of it. You know, for him, the human will is the highest gradation because it rises above the muck of the lower grades. Uh, and but the, when we see forces like gravity, uh, you know, the objects are compelled or you know upheld in certain directions by some force or rigidity where they resist that. These for him are sort of like the lowest grades of the will as manifested in in the world that we see, the phenomenal world. So let's read this quote here and see how this works itself out in architecture. Properly speaking, the conflict between gravity and rigidity is the sole aesthetic material of architecture. Its problem is to make the conflict appear with perfect distinctness in a multitude of different ways. It solves it by depriving these indestructible forces of the shortest way to their satisfaction and conducting them by a circuitous route so that the conflict is lengthened and the inexhaustible efforts of both forces become visible in many different ways. I think this is a good example of that, right? Very circuitous, right? Uh, the whole mass of the building, if left to its original tendency, would exhibit a mere heap or clump bound as closely as possible to the earth, to which gravity, the form in which the will appears here, continually presses, while rigidity, also objectivity of the will resists. Okay, so in art we find beauty in our recognition of these forces, uh, at least in architecture, this is the case, right? Therefore the beauty of any ray of a building lies in the obvious adaptation of every part, not to the outward arbitrary end of man. So far that, that that's belongs to the work of practical architecture, right? So we're not looking at the building in so far as it's useful, or, or it serves a function and when, we're, when we're making a beauty of judgment. In this regard, he's right there with Kant. <clears throat> but how do we make the judgment of beauty? Directly, uh, it's based on uh, a stability of the whole to which the position, the dimensions, and form of every part must have so necessary a relation to that, to the stability, uh, where it's possible if any one part were taken away, the whole would fall to pieces. Just it's like a Jenga pile with you know you gotta you can't you can't move that that one block right if you know that game Jenga maybe people won't get the reference for just because each part bears just as much as it conveniently can and each is supported just where it requires to be and just to the to the necessary extent this opposition unfolds itself this conflict between rigidity and gravity which constitutes the life the manifestation of the will in the stone becomes completely visible. And these lowest grades of the objectivity of the will, right, gravity and rigidity, reveal themselves distinctly. All this proves that architecture does not affect us mathematically, but also dynamically. And that what speaks to us through it is not mere form and symmetry. This is where I think he would be stepping away from a traditional reading of Plato, Right? It's not about the form and the symmetry of the architecture, it's the interplay of these forces that strikes us, right? the rigidity and the gravity and the stability of the structure. Right? Those fundamental forces of nature, those first ideas in the platonic sense, at least he, how he understands 
the platonic idea. Those lowest grades of the objectivity of the will. This also he would gather from Plato and even more so the Neoplatonist, the sort of gradations of the will, that the will, you know, for Plato it's more gradations of being. Uh, some things have more being and existence than others and truth is equated with that as well and also goodness. But uh, you know, for him it's a little bit different. Again, review the previous videos for more on uh, Schopenhauer's Platonism. The regularity of the building and its parts is partly produced by the direct adaptation of each member to the stability of the whole. All right, now how does, how does architecture compare to other arts? Um, there are some unique things about it that he points out. One of them here in this quote, architecture has this distinction from plastic art and poetry. Right, so when we're talking about the plastic arts, you know, sculpture, painting, etc., or poetry, you know, arts of language, I guess you might say the written word, it, uh, what's the difference <clears throat> between that architecture? Or architecture has this distinction, it does not give us a copy, but a thing itself, the, the thing itself. Um, it does not repeat, as they do, the known idea, so that the artist lends his eyes to the beholder and faci facilitates for him the comprehension of the idea by bringing the actual individual object to a distinct and complete expression of its nature. Right? So in the other arts, right, in a painting, the artist does this, right? The artist lends his eyes to the beholder. So when I see a painting, according to Schopenhauer, the, the, the artist is helping to facilitate in me the comprehension of the idea, the, the platonic idea. Right, the, the, the idea of what is best and, and greatest and what the will is striving for, the objective uh, uh, side of the will underlying the, the particular thing, right? There's this individual object um, that's actual, right? The actual pear that I'm seeing or the actual you know, basket of fruit. And then there's the painting of it, right? And the painting is a distinct and complete expression of its nature, a complete and distinct com uh, expression of its nature, right, that does this, that facilitates me to comprehend the idea in it. Not so with architecture, right? The architect, when he creates the building, when, when the architect designs it and the building is built by the, the, the engineers and all the builders and the construction workers, once that building is complete, the, it's not a copy. It's not a copy of an actual thing. It is the thing. It presents the thing itself. So that's one thing that's distinct about architecture. Also, he says, unlike the works of the other arts, those of architecture are very seldom executed for purely aesthetic ends. Right? These, so, so when we build a building, we're going to use it typically. We don't build buildings just to look at them and just to enjoy them uh, aesthetically. That's different from a, you know, a certain painting or something like this. So these are generally subordinated to other useful ends which are foreign to art itself. Thus, the great merit of architecture consists in achieving and attaining the pure aesthetic ends in spite of their subordination to the other ends which are foreign to them. Right now, the picture here of a, a library in China, right? The Xi Jinping uh, Bihai uh, Library. I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, probably butchered it. But obviously, they had to design it in such a way uh, in which it would be functional, right? Uh, and so, for Schopenhauer is saying that that's the great merit of architecture, that it has to somehow conform to the function if it can actually execute the building functionally and yet still retain a, a beautiful aesthetic appeal to it. Like, I, I think this one obviously does. I mean, you disagree with me. I think it's a pretty cool looking library, at least the lobby. Um, but that is hard. You know, you're, you're, you're balancing these two demands, right? You want to, you know, deal with these pure aesthetic concerns. At the same time, you want the building uh, to be functional and to work uh, for what, it, what its purpose is. The will in nature. Okay, so now we're moving on to, uh, uh, you know, landscape paintings and things like this, right? Why do we find beauty in nature? Schopenhauer tackles this with his metaphysical conception of the will, right? Where do we see the will in nature and how does this um, how does this manifest itself in works of art? Let's read this long quote here and break it down. The vegetable world offers itself everywhere for aesthetic enjoyment without the medium of art. So you don't have to look at a painting of, 
of a still life painting of a bass, a fruit, a basket fruit, a, sorry, a fruit basket. Uh, you can actually look at the real fruit basket. Uh, but so far as it is an object of art, it belongs principally to landscape painting, to the province of which all the rest of unconscious nature also belongs in paintings of still life and of mere architecture, ruins, interiors of churches, right? Such, you know, paintings of buildings, paintings of landscapes and things like this, um, etc. The subjective side of the aesthetic pleasure is predominant. Where we said this in previous videos, he says that you've got these two poles of the will. You've got the, the platonic idea, which is the objective pole, and then you've got the will, right? This sort of subjective pole. And in, in these works of art, he says that the subjective side of our, our aesthetic pleasure is predominant. We, it's the sort of the willless subject, not the, the platonic idea that dominates. Um, in other words, our satisfaction does not lie principally in the direct comprehension of represented ideas, but rather in the subjective cor uh, correlative uh, of correlative of this comprehension, pure willless knowing. For because the painter lets us see these things through his eyes, we at once receive a sympathetic and reflected sense of the deep spiritual peace and absolute silence of the will, which were necessary in order to enter with knowledge so entirely into these lifeless objects and comprehend them with such love. In other words, in this case, with such a degree of objectivity. So when we look at a painting in a museum of the still life, it allows us to see the, the, the object more objectively. Uh, it, it allows us to be more detached and to uh, contemplate it with, as a willless subject. We talked more about that uh, in previous videos, so I won't dive too much into it here. It is that very will which constitutes our own nature that appears here to us in forms. So, that, you know, this is almost like Aristotle. Uh, in a way, in fact, I, I think he owes a little bit to Aristotle that he, he he's not even aware of this. Maybe uh, his his view of Platonism kind of seems Aristotelian, right? These 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 the, the fruit is has a will just like we do. Uh, it has a vegetable will, I suppose, right? For Aristotle, there was a vegetable soul, vegetative soul. Uh, there was the animal soul, yeah, sort of a, the sentient soul. And then there was the rational, which, you know, and a human had all three of those. We had all three capacities, you know. But uh, so uh, he's sort of thinking there when he says, you know, I, I look at the fruit, I look at the vegetables, and I see a manifestation of a will, uh, which is not, not, it's not in us controlled and tempered by the intellect, uh, but exhibits itself in stronger traits and with a distinctness that borders on grotesque and monstrous. For this very reason, there's no concealment. Uh, it is free, naive, open as the day, and this is the cause of our interest in animals. So even more so than, than, than still lives, we love to see paintings of actual animals because they're even more, I guess they're a higher, higher grade of will. And so um, they're more fascinating to us, right? They, 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 they excite in us uh, more interest, he says. The characteristics of the species appear already in the representation of plants, right? So when I see the still life of all these, these plants, uh, you know, these dead, they're dead now, I suppose, right? It's called plants of fruit, vegetables, whatever. This little picnic scene, right? Uh, we do see a characteristic of the species, right? And that's nice, right? Okay, well, that's, they're all peaches here, and that looks like a, a honeydew, and there's some bread that's not really a plant. Uh, anyway, but it only shows itself in forms, he says. Here, when we're looking at the, uh, the animals, right, here it becomes much more distinct and expresses itself not only in form, so we're not only just looking at, okay, well, that's just a wild boar, and these are all a bunch of dogs attacking it. Um, you know, obviously that's the form of, uh, of you know, the outline of the body of the dog, just like the outline of the body of the plant, but we also get the action, right? You see, uh, these animals in a dynamic sort of struggle with each other, right? In action, in position, right? The way their body is it, it, it is swerved and, 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 and elongated even here. This looks like almost a greyhound, sort of elongated. Uh, and the mien, right? The sort of facial expression, the, the, the character, right? Uh, um, and yet always, always merely though, right? You, want, you, want, you don't want to go too far on the, uh, with this, Schopenhauer says always merely as the character of the species, not of the individual, right? So we don't get, 
You know, this is not like uh, wa uh, Wally the Wild Boar. This is just a boar, says uh, uh, Schopenhauer. It's just, he's a representative of the species of all wild boars, uh, not the individual, right? This is not a character study of this particular boar. So we see in them the manifold grades and modes of the manifestation of will, which in all beings is one and the same grade. Will always in the same, wills always in the same way, which objectifies itself as life, as existence in such endless variety and such different forms, which are all adaptations to the different external circumstances and may be compared to many variations on the same theme. Right, when we look around us, we're seeing manifestations of the will, all trying basically, it's, it's, it's all manifestations of, a, sorry, variations of a theme, right? A, a different version of the same song. But if we had to communicate to the observer, oh, I don't think that was for me. I live in a busy neighborhood, sorry. Even though it is the COVID virus, I live in a kind of industrial neighborhood. So if you hear car noises in the background, please forgive me. I'm doing as best I can given the circumstances. All right, so again, uh, all of these manifestations of the will and nature are variations on a theme, and, but if we, if we had to communicate what is the theme, right, uh, to the observer, uh, if, we had to ask, if he asked us what is it, what are they saying, for reflection, in a word, the explanation of their inner nature, it would be best to make use of the Sanskrit formula. You know, he's getting back into the ancient Hindu wisdom, right, that he was so influenced by. The ancient, uh, sorry, the, the, the Sanskrit formula which occurs so often in the ancient books of the Hindus, which is called Mahavakya, in other words, the great word, Tatwanasi, which means this living thing art thou, right? So when we look at these works of art, what, 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 what is being expressed? What, what will is being expressed, right? In the plant, in the animal, in all forms and gradations of the will. It's this one sort of uh, uh, formula. This living thing art thou. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a rock that likes to fall down, right? I'm a boar that likes to uh, roam around the woods and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, look for truffles and things to gnaw on the bottom of trees and uh, run away from wild dogs, right? I'm expressing my will. Uh, I, you know, I'm a peach. I'm trying to be a peach and get as ripe as I possibly can. Okay, so you get the picture. Uh, now we're gonna turn to human beauty. And he has a lot to say about this, so I'm going to leave most of it for the next vi video, okay? We'll stop uh, in a minute here, but let's go ahead and get started with human beauty uh, in this one, and we'll pick it up uh, in more depth in the next video. But let's do the first couple of quotes I have set aside here as regards to human beauty, because for him, the human will, I think I mentioned this already before earlier in the video, is the highest... Uh, form of will objectified, right? When we see human beings acting and willing, uh, including our own will, which we have the most intimate contact with, for him, this is the highest objectification of the will possible, okay? So let's get started on his, his, his exploration of this uh, just briefly, and then we'll dive deeper into it in the next video. Okay, so human beauty is an objective expression, which means the fullest objectification of will at the highest grade at which it is knowable. The idea of man in general, right, the platonic idea of man in general, completely expressed in the sensible form. But however much the objective side of the beautiful appears here, the subjective side still always accompanies it. Now this is what's a bit, I guess, different from the portraits of animals and the still life is that you have side by side the objective, right? You have that platonic ideal, but there's there's never going to be left the subjective, right? The, this famous painting by Vermeer, the girl with the pearl earring, uh, right? It's it's this painting of this pretty young lady, right, with this with 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 with, with a, a sash on her head, and she's got a certain character, right? The Mona Lisa has a certain character that's her own, right? At least this is what Schopenhauer is trying to claim here. If it's a beautiful work of art, there's this sort of uniqueness about each person that has to be represented in the painting at the same time as the objective side, the sort of platonic ideal is also objectified. Okay, so uh, one more quick quote about this. Uh, it kind of brings it out what I just said, and then we'll stop the video there. The most characteristic lion, wolf, horse, sheep, or ox was always the most beautiful also. 
The reason of this is that animals have only the character of their species, no individual character. In the representation of men, the character of the species is separated from that of the individual. The former is now called beauty, entirely in the objective sense. But the latter retains the name, character, or expression, and the new difficulty arises of representing both at once and completely in the same individual, right? So this is a difficult challenge for the artist. How do you paint a painting of, you know, let's say you're painting a painting of someone famous. How do you bring out their character that's unique to them, but at the same time showing them as this sort of ideal, as this platonic ideal, right? As this sort of objectification of the, wi the will at its highest grade. Um, I'm sure some people listening here might be um, wanting to push back on Schopenhauer, so I'll end the video with this maybe criticism of what's just been said. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of pet owners who are watching this who might beg to differ that the anim animals don't have a character of their own and they only exhibit the traits of their species, right? If you're a dog owner, you say, my dog has a great personality, it's different from that dog, and my cat or whatever. Um, so I don't know, maybe maybe this is something I could think, this could be maybe a good paper topic, who, who knows? Uh, <clears throat> for the class, but that's something you might you might want to push back on. But this is a typical uh, philosopher of the modern era, right? The, the humans are rational, uh, animals irrational. Therefore, they're just going on instincts, and so they're just sort of all carbon copies of one another. And the only difference between them is based on external conditions, nutrition, things like this. Uh, you know, but they're all they all have the same sort of will. Whereas we have this rationality, and that makes us unique and have more character. And I'll I'll grant that we are typically more unique individually uh, than perhaps uh, a certain species of uh, lions or oxes or whatever. But I'm sure that if you're like a farmer or somebody who works out. And, and hangs out on a, a, out in the country and maybe uh, has, has, has been a rancher particularly. Rancher is probably the better uh, example. Uh, you know that certainly uh, different cows, different bulls, different horses, etc., will have different character, right? You'll have different temperaments and things like that. Personalities, all their own. All right, well, I'm going off a little bit digressing on that, so I better just stop the video here. We're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off, talking about human beauty and a few more other things about uh, sort of what you might call epistemological claims, not like a theory about theories of knowledge. How, how do we know uh, things about beauty? Uh, is it based on a concept? Uh, we'll talk more about Schopenhauer's view on that on the other side. All right, thanks. See you next time.